Hello. This is going to be a mini lecture on chapter two of Maurizio's classical mythology in context. So um, I'll be doing these mini lectures, probably one per chapter um, through the course of the term. Uh, you can look at them or not look at them. That's really up to you. They might help at least stuff that jumps out at me. So first of all, what we're going to be, the main work that we're looking at in chapter two is Hesiod's Theogony. So a little bit about Hesiod. Hesiod was an oral poet. He, uh, that means he did not compose in writing. Um, instead, he composed in performance, orally, uh, before an audience. And so at some point, the work got written down. Uh, we don't know when that was. Hesiod lived in the 8th century BCE, so the 700s. Um, <clears throat> some people would put Hesiod after Homer. In other words, that the Iliad and the Odyssey predate the Theogony and Hesiod's other work, the works and days. I think I would lean more towards they're sort of around the same time. The Iliad probably is the oldest of the things we have but the Theogony and Works and Days might come in between that and the Odyssey. So we're all dealing in this period at the end of the 8th century. When the works were written down is unclear. Uh, in the case of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey that we have, I think almost certainly go back to uh, an edition that was made in uh, around 520 or so BCE. So that at least what the the thing we have, you know, we can maybe date to that. In Hesiod's case, it's a little bit more iffy because we know there was an official text of, of the, I mean, the Odyssey made in Athens uh, at that time. Uh, but we don't know in the case of Hesiod when that would have happened. It's just unlikely literacy in Greece starts, the creation of the Greek alphabet is sometime around 800. It seems unlikely that any time in that first hundred years they were writing anything down quite as complex as uh, Hesiod's Theogony or, or Homer's works. So, um, but because it's an oral work, that means it has what are called formulae. These are phrases that help the, uh, c the composer uh, and performer uh, compose in performance. Uh, if you're having to think of each word as you go along, you're going to be stopping, going, ah, mm, blah, and that's, of course, going to ruin the whole thing. So what you want to do is you want to have something that will smooth that over. So if you have set phrases, it's a lot easier. And you'll see one at one point in the Theogony, there's a point where um, Gaia says of Uranus, her husband, uh, that, um, you know, he's, he's an ugly, you know, character. Uh, and after all, he started it by his actions or something like that. And then that same line, the like exact same line that, that she delivers is delivered then by Cronus, who says, after all, he started this ugly business. So that's a clear instance of a formulaic line where a whole line was repeated uh, verbatim. Um, and there are some formulaic lines in, in Homer's um, uh, Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, when rosy-fingered dawn, you know, got up from the bed of Tithonus or something like that, that's a set line indicating this a new day. Um, so, <clears throat> again, those formulas are helpful. They help the performer, you know, actually put things together in performance. Um, the most common formulae are things like uh, in the Iliad, you've got things like swift-footed Achilles, uh, man-killing Hector, uh, Ajax of the with the giant shield, um, those sort of phrases. Those are set phrases associated with particular characters, and when those characters appear, they often get those attributes attached to them, whether it's appropriate or not in the moment, because it helps complete the line. Okay, so... Uh, he's, he uh, is from the area called Boeotia. This is in north central Greece. Um, he likely was from a rural area. He says that he was actually from a rural area called Ascra, but we do not know that for sure. Uh, the part of his, you know, reason for saying that might be to give him street cred in delivering the poem, The Works and Days. That's where he says that. 
uh, in the Theogony, he says he's tending sheep. Again, that's unlikely that he was that he started off as a shepherd and then he came somehow to magically become a uh, singer. You would become a singer through a lifelong process. It wouldn't be something that would suddenly happen to you in adulthood. Okay. The um, Theogony, the, the, the work itself, uh, has a lot of episodes and a lot of like digressions, uh, but the basic story is the birth of the gods. So we, we have the sort of like the creation of Earth, and then from Earth comes the come the early gods, and then come an intermediate group of gods called the Titans. Then come the Olympian gods, and then you have the rise of Zeus. So the 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 culmination of the work is the rise of Zeus, and why Zeus is king. He's going to stay king because he's so smart and he's better than the other guys. He deserves to be king uh, because of the good job he does, but he also is smarter than the rest, so he can't be overthrown like they were. So, one thing that, that I want you to keep in mind when you read the castration of Uranus scene is the concept of the earth and sky in Hesiod's time. So, what you've got in that scene is, the setup in the Theogony is that Uranus hates his children. He fears them and hates them. He wants to stay in power. And what he does is when they are born, he shoves them back into Mother Earth. Right, so they, they sort of start to come out and then he shoves them back. So they are, and then of course, Earth gets pretty upset about this and then plots his overthrow. But, there's probably something else going on, and I'm going to talk about the Egyptian account, which is a little bit different. But first, let's consider the way the Greeks would have conceived, at Hesiod's time, would have conceived the Earth. So they would have seen the Earth as a flat disk. So it would have been a flat disk. Above it would have been a dome that would have been solid that would have been the sky. So in other words, the sky is actually a, a solid on which are fixed the stars. The stars are like, like pits in the sky that then shine at night. And then underneath it, there is a bowl, and in that bowl, that's Tartarus, that's the underworld. Okay, so that's the image. So imagine a sphere divided in half by the Earth. The Earth is surrounded by the river ocean. Above it is the sky. Below it is, the, is Tartarus. Now, if sky is solid, and Gaia, Earth, is, is solid. They're having sex originally as flat solids. They're on top of one another. If they're having sex on top of one another and they're flat, there's no way that they can disengage from one another, so they're stuck together, and that means nothing can come out. Life can't happen. For that to happen, what happens in the Egyptian account where sky is female and earth is male, so they, they have the different genders, but what happens there is that um, earth is in the Egyptian account is castrated, just like Uranus in the Greek account is castrated, and that causes, when that happens, that causes sky to spring up in a dome over the earth, and now the creatures that were born of sky have a place to move around. So, my feeling is that concept is the original idea behind this whole thing. Um, and that sometime, probably before Hesiod himself, it gets caught up in this dynastic battle for control. So you've got Uranus who wants to hold on to power, you've got his son Cronus who wants to take power, and you've got Guy who's upset with her husband and wants to punish him because of his actions. And so the, the whole story that for the Egyptians is purely um, a, a physics problem. We're, we've got these two things stuck together. We need something that will unadhesive them so that you can spring up um, Earth on top um, or you, know, the, you can spring up um, sky so that now there's room in between for people to move around. It's purely a practical problem in the Egyptian account. But in Hesiod's account, and it probably doesn't start with Hesiod, it, it's tied up with personalities, and there's much more animus, and there's much more sort of like a, a fight going on for control. 
So I think that that was layered onto what was originally a practical issue, that sky is solid on top of earth, it's solid, there's no room to move, and you need something to spring sky up. Castration, boop, suddenly they're detached, and then it, sky springs up as a dome. Um, so keep that in mind. It's, you will not find that in, in the Hesiod account. The Hesiod account has earth, uh, it has sky shoving the kids back into Earth, um, but that would also apply if they were stuck together, right? There'd be no room for them to come out. All right, the scholarship in Chapter 2 involves this man, Bronislav Malinowski. Uh, those are his dates, 1884 to 1942, and his big contribution to mythology, there are really two things. Um, he's... Uh, was very much a pioneer in going to actual sites to study the myths of the people there in their site. So what happened to him was it, during World War One, or before World War One, he was studying the myths of the Trobriand Islanders. So Tro the Trobriand Islands uh, is uh, over near New Zealand. It's in that area, um, and uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, uh, World War One broke out. Malinowski, who was Polish, Poland was under the control of Germany, and of course the Germans are um, the opponents of the British in World War One, and so he was not allowed to leave the Trobriand Island uh, during World War One. So he had a long time to study them and, and their stories, which he did. And Malinowski sort of got interested in myth from reading some scholars. Uh, who were all about like taking myths from all over the world and just comparing them and contrasting them without any real sort of rationale. They, there was no clear uh, way of doing that and he did not like their sloppiness. Um, and then when he went to the when he went to the Trobriand Islands um, and he did this intensive study of, the, of their myth making, um, what he sort of came to believe was that the only way you could really make sense of the myths was by studying them in place with the culture that they came from. And then within that context, you could determine what the meaning was and that that meaning was not really transferable. In other words, the Trobriand Islander myths have meaning for them, but would not have meaning really for, other, for others, at least not in the same way. Um, the other thing was the charter myths. Uh, and so charter myths are myths which establish some sort of practice or uh, at least back up the re rationale for some sort of practice. So for instance, an instance of a charter myth might be from Genesis. Um, the, after Adam and Eve eat the, um, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they realize they're naked and then they make clothing to cover up their nakedness out of shame. So this idea that you wear clothes because nakedness is shameful and therefore you have to cover it up, uh, brings in a practice, right? In other words, people in the Middle East theoretically could much of the year go around near naked because it's very warm there and they don't really need the clothing um, to, you know, to, it certainly it, it would be an imposition to be wearing a lot of clothing. But here you've got this story where they realize this and then it becomes sort of a rule that you have to wear clothes, right, in public. Um, you know, when you're in private with your special person, you can be naked um, and you can, you know, enjoy each other's bodies. But in a public setting, you cannot be naked. Um, and that would be a charter myth, right? It, the myth establishes the rationale for that. They, they did something, they ate from this tree of knowledge, and that caused them to realize they were naked, and then they took some steps to do something about that. Okay, two more points, one of which I've got a, a little slide here for, and this is the artwork at the end of chapter two. So one of the things that Mauricio is going to do at the end of each chapter, in the final section of each chapter, is she's going to look at what a Ger which German scholars would call Nachleben, literally means after life. Uh, and this would be what happens to the story, what happens to the myth, what happens to the particular figure later after the time when that figure was created. So we could look at figures um, in, uh, you know, uh, modern, it, well, in, you know, 
literature from years ago and we can look at how that character develops over time that you know the there's the original character but then over time that character changes and how that character gets used that would be an instance of knock um, so if we like have a movie like Troy about the Trojan War that's an instance of knock right it shows a lot about our views of that ancient conflict which may or may not have much to do with that actual conflict. Um, so these two works, uh, it's a, a, a bronze statue of Prometheus and a bronze statue of, of Atlas. Um, they are both in uh, New York City. They're both in Rockefeller Center. Um, um, the Prometheus by Manship um, suggests Prometheus as a positive figure who's bringing fire to humankind starts, ignites the spark of creativity, which allows for the creation of the modern world, right? So he is a positive figure leading to this wonderland that we live in. So he's a positive figure, not the figure that we see in Hesiod, where he's really sort of like just a joker who plays tricks, and those tricks go wrong, and in a sense, everyone pays for it. The um, uh, Atlas by Lowry shows Atlas holding up the, the, in this case, he's holding up a globe, but he's holding up the sky. That's the punishment that he gets from Zeus after uh, participating in the Titanomachy against Zeus. Now, Atlas is generally viewed in the ancient world as being sort of a, a, an out of control bad guy that Zeus really had to take care of. Here, we see a figure who basically is enduring great strain to keep everything going. And again, that seems to refer, it seems to tie in very much with the atmosphere in New York in the 1930s, where despite the Great Depression, uh, Rockefeller Center was being built, the Empire State Building was being built, all these great things were being built and done, despite the fact that there was this crushing depression, and that you can endure, you can get past it somehow if you're just tough enough. And so that's, a, again, Atlas is here presented as a positive figure and not a negative. The one last thing that I do want to say, and this is again about the theogony, is something called catalogs. So catalogs are lists of things. So there, are, there's a, a catalog of the daughters of ocean. There's also a catalog of sorts of um, women that Zeus has sex with, um, you know, later in the work. The imp the reason that catalogs are there are a couple of reasons for catalogs. One is people do want to know like something that ties the ancient way to the modern world. This is the way catalogs work in Genesis where we have a have, have passages called the begats where one guy begats something else, begats another person and so forth and we get the generation from say Abraham all the way up to the near modern world. And that ties this ancient figure from the myths of of, of myth to history, right? So that, that would be one of the things that catalogs do. They sort of provide this bridge. But the other thing is catalogs in oral poetry are challenges. Uh, if you are an oral poet, right? I remember I mentioned the formulas. Formulas help you get through that. Well, formulas provide like half line sections and you can have whole line formulae. You can even have whole scenes like the preparation of a meal or the uh, donning of armor. Those would be set scenes that you could repeat. And you can change them a little bit, but you basically have a set format. And that means your brain can go in autopilot and you can do that scene and you can do it right every single time. But with catalogs where you've got a, a whole list of names, that's a little bit different because not all those figures have uh, epithets. They don't all have like an adjective going with them. So they, they're not all in formulaic phrases. And oftentimes in the form in the in those catalogs, that's the only time that character appears in the work as a whole, right? It's just sort of a name, it's a list. So that means that's a lot more difficult for the performer. The performer has to really sort of have that largely in um, in the brain, like in its entirety, and he cannot slip up at all. Um, and so I'm I'm really think that when the ancients ancient bards performed formula, performed catalogs in their works, those were moments where people were like, is he going to get through it? Is he going to get through it? Or is he going to like trip? Is he going to like 
put in a name that doesn't quite fit, and then it, then the meter will be off, and then it, you know we're like we'll all notice it, and, and we'll laugh them off the stage. Um, that's sort of what's going on. This is really like you know I'm going to show you how good I am. I'm going to go on for the next five minutes in this catalog of names, and I'm not going to make a mistake. And I think that's where. And the audience only knows that he didn't make a mistake because he doesn't lose the beat, he doesn't lose the meter, he doesn't sort of lose the track of the song. It always, it, it sounds right. I mean, that would be the tip off that, uh oh, the guy tossed in something there that didn't belong. So at any rate, I wanted to toss that in the, the bit about catalogs because again, for us, like it's a list of names and it's like, oh man, do I have to know all these? Are they gonna appear on the test? And the answer is no, I'm not gonna grab a bunch of stuff from the catalogs. Um, I would, if I would be hard pressed to name a lot of the things that were in those catalogs myself, so I'm, they, they won't be on test or anything. Okay, so that's what I got in, min, in a mini lecture. It went a little bit over. Uh, I like what I like. Um, I'm going to try to keep them a little bit closer to 15 minutes, but uh, that's chapter two. So onward to chapter three.